worked with uh, my student, Leroy Gia, Bob Pelkovitz at Brown, uh, especially Zvonimir Dojic, who's our experimental collaborator, and there are many other people. Um, I'll especially point out Andrew Belchinus, who's been the student who's been working most closely with us. I'm going to focus on the three-dimensional shapes that these two-dimensional colloidal membranes make, and I'll talk about three different problems. On the left here, you see a flat membrane, which when cooled, uh, starts to ripple along the edges. And I'm just going to talk about the instability of that edge and talk about how it ripples into three dimensions. What happens later, as you um, continue to watch this process develop, is you get these elongated, twisted ribbons. You can also get these ribbons from the flat phase of uh, such a membrane by stretching it, by grabbing onto the ends with laser tweezers, or actually some handles so that you don't apply a torque to the membrane, and pulling on it. You get these thin ribbons. These are liquid ribbons, is what I'm going to argue. And this is work in progress. And finally, the last uh, problem that we'll look at is also work in progress. These are three-dimensional axisymmetric shapes that they see when they take these membranes, which are made out of rods, and dope them with smaller rods. And we're going to try to develop an effective theory for this. So the colloids in these colloidal membranes are viruses. So if you'd like, you can think about the molecules in this membrane as being these rods. The rods are about a micron long, seven nanometers in diameter. You put them in solution with polymers like dextran, and the uh, depletion force pushes them together, and they self-assemble into these membranes. This is just a cartoon. It's not the scale. And you see in the middle of the membrane, all the rods are more or less pointing up. These uh, membranes are analogous to lipid bilayer membranes. They're fluid, so here you um, see a, a movie where a few of the particles have been fluorescently labeled and they have a beautiful mean square displacement which is linear in time. They fluctuate um, readily just like fluid membranes here. You can see the edge is fluctuating. Of course they're not bilayers and of course they're much bigger and they have distinctive properties as well. They have free edges. Uh, they don't tend to form vesicles like lipid bilayer membranes and they typically also have saddle shapes, negative Gaussian curvature. They're suspended in a fluid. They're actually a little bit heavier than the fluid, so they tend to sediment. So in all the experiments that are done here, they have a polyacrylamide brush on the bottom, which the dextran can penetrate so it doesn't adhere to the bottom. Yeah. I'll say more. Is there another question? Uh, they don't have a characteristic size. They grow until there's not enough uh, rods. So they don't have a characteristic size. Yeah. They have an interesting liquid crystalline structure. The rods, as I said, in the middle are more or less parallel and perpendicular to the surface, but as you get to the edge, they twist. And here's a visualization. They can visualize the twist. And there's a, so there's a twist penetration depth. We've seen in talks here that you know the twist can't penetrate into a flat, layer. The twist penetration depth is typically around half of a micron. Why do the rods twist? Now, the rods are typically chiral, but not all the rods are chiral or not, you know, at high temperature, for example, they form a pneumatic phase that doesn't have twist. And even those rods will twist at the edge when they form these membranes. And the reason uh, is this depletion force. Remember these polymers, you can think of them as, as little hard spheres, and the centers of those spheres can't get any closer to the interface. This is a side view, an electron micrograph of the edge of a membrane, and the blue layer is the layer from which the centers of these polymers are excluded. So there's an ent entropy cost, right? There's a free energy which is proportional to the interface between the rods and the solution, and just like an ordinary droplet, that interfacial energy is going to not want to have uh, sharp edges. It wants to have smooth edges, so it can do that by twisting the rods. So what we're going to do is try to explain these three-dimensional shapes by not trying to solve for all the liquid crystal degrees of freedom. Because twist penetration depth is typically small compared to the size of the membrane, we're going to try to put all the liquid crystalline properties into properties of the edge, like a line tension and other effective properties. We, you know, Of course, other people and our group as well has looked at trying to account for of the degrees of freedom, but I'm going to focus on this effective theory and see how far we can take it. So here's an example of this kind of thinking. I mentioned that when you cool this system, the uh, so for example, if you take a lot of these rods and concentrate them, forget about the polymers, just the rods at high temperatures above 60 degrees, 
they form in the matic phase. When you cool it, they twist, and the pitch gets shorter and shorter the lower the temperature. So you can control the pitch that way. And remember now, when we go back to the membranes, now we've got the polymers, we have the membranes, the rods are twisted here even at high temperature. And you could ask about the Frank energy, the liquid crystal energy, just in this edge region. And we can make an effective theory to predict or estimate what the line tension should be, right? So the rods are twisted, and then if you cool it, they're going to be a little close, closer to the desired twist, the twist that the, the Frank energy, the intrinsic desire to twist, says it should be. So the line tension, the effective edge energy, should be reduced. So we can estimate what that is, and the prediction is that the uh, lowering the temperature, increasing the chirality, should uh, lessen the cost for having edges. Here's another example of this kind of thinking. The uh, edge of the membrane is where the rods more or less lie down. They don't have to exactly lie down in the plane of the membrane, but they're, they're more or less lying down. So you could think of this like a one-dimensional pneumatic phase. So if you have a straight edge, those rods are all parallel to the edge. Benny? Yeah, straight edge, the rods are all parallel. If the edge curves, then those rods are going to have liquid crystal bend. That's going to cost energy. So we could estimate what that bend cost is. We know what the thickness of the membrane D is. We know what the, um, this penetration depth lambda, we roughly know what the bend uh, Frank constant is, and we think of the bend stiffness of the edge should be about 100 kBT microns. So it's like a, an elastic rod. Should I come back to your... Yes. Well, there's always a cost, even if they're not chiral, they're, they're still twisted. So there's a cost to having the edge here. And there's also just a cost for, ha I mean, the, the rods are twisted here. Because there's an energy cost. To have the, mo the more of this ha you have, you're going to have more of the rods that are twisted. So there'll be a positive energy cost. Yes. The top panel, the top panel is, I'm just saying that the rods themselves have an intrinsic desire to twist as a function of temperature. So the top panel is, is the pneumatic phase where you don't have polymers, just supposed to rep, it's, it doesn't look like a pneumatic, I just wasn't, it's not a very good drawing, right? They're not all ordered. It's an, it's, and the top is a pneumatic at high temperature, and then it's cholesteric as you lower the temperature below 60 degrees. So I'm just saying that you can tune the intrinsic desire to twist by changing the temperature. Regardless of this, that's just the fact about the liquid crystal that you can make out of these viruses. Um, yes, it goes up like a square root. I, I mean, I don't know exactly what happens beyond where they look at these membranes. We don't get to a point where it saturates. Yes. Uh, I'll show you. I'll come to that. It, it dominates. The line tension dominates. All right, so we have those contributions. So here are some measurements of these quantities. We saw it, so Daniel talked about something like this uh, this morning. We can use the equipartition theorem and look at the fluctuations of the edges. And um, you know, from line tension, we expect a KBT over Q squared. Here the experimentalists have factored out a factor of Q squared so that um, for uh, low Q, you see that this quantity saturates, and it's going to look like KBT over the line tension. So as you increase the chirality, decrease the temperature, you see the fluctuations go up. That is this effect of lowering the line tension by increasing the chirality. At high Q, uh, we see that it falls off with a slope of 2 here on this log-log plot. And you know roughly, these quantities come out to be 100 KBT microns, 100 KBT KBT per micron for the line tension. This is for this particular strain. I'll show another strain later where the line tension is bigger. And actually, Leo, that's the case where you know the, you have to look at the size of the membranes also to ask about what, and, and, and that's the case where the line tension uh, dominates. Okay, so those are the basic edge quantities we're going to use. We're going to think about these membranes bending in three-dimensional space. So we'll use the Kahnem Helfrich energy. Uh, you could complain a little bit. These membranes are very thick. I'm just going to consider that they are. Uh, very, very thin and not worry about that. We'll see how far we can get. Um, we 
because the membranes have edges, this is a good system to study effects of the Gaussian curvature modulus because the energy or the contribution to the energy of that kappa bar times the integral of the Gaussian curvature term, that depends on the shape of the membrane. Like it wouldn't depend on the, you know, the fluctuations or shape of a membrane in a closed vesicle. Uh, so how big are these quantities? Kappa. Um, they can measure kappa, or we can measure kappa. So they can make vesicles out of these systems. So they take uh, the, the, the membrane I was showing you with the one micron length rods. They typically don't form vesicles, but recently using shorter rods, which presumably make much more flexible membranes, they've been able to make membranes uh, that close up and form vesicles. So this is one vesicle looked at from two perpendicular point of views. And the colloids, uh, you know, they're heavier than water, as I mentioned, and the membranes themselves are 80% water, so they're, f they're permeable to water. We don't have to worry about conserving the volume so the, you know, water can get squeezed out. This membrane sags a little bit because it's heavier, and we can calculate how much it should sag. Uh, we know the, um, the density of the membrane. We know the acceleration of gravity. We know what the area of the membrane is with the bending stiffness kappa. Uh, we can make a dimensionless parameter and we can calculate all these shapes. We think the area is fixed. Um, notice that on this plot, I've scaled, or actually Leroy Gia, my student, has scaled the dimensions by this characteristic length, L0. So these all have the same area. It's just scaled to make it more dramatic. Um, and we can compare the shape with what the experimentalists measure. And we come up with a bending stiffness for these short rods, which is about 6,000 kBT. So now if we want to compare that or, or make a an estimate for the longer rods, which are three times longer, you know, it's going to be bigger. So we take the ratio of the, the thicknesses. So it's very big. And um, there are some recent measurements of the um, compression modulus of the membrane. Um, and using those measurements for the long rods and the thickness of the long rods, we get a similar prediction, 100,000 kBT for the stiffness. So that seems very big. It is very big. Um, it's much bigger, we think, than the Gaussian curvature modulus. So here we actually have a kind of estimate. Um, I, don't, I don't really understand why the uh, bending stiffness kappa is so large. Yeah. Right. Sure. It could be different. This is just an estimate. It's the best, I, you know. For They're stiff rods, but they have some interaction between them. Uh, yeah, OK, well. Um, that's fine. Uh, I still think it's big. <laughs> it's a factor of eight. You know, it's, uh, we also estimate this Gaussian curvature modulus. And again, using these continuum ideas, although here we're not, well, so we're, we are going to use these continuum ideas. Here I'm just going to use the Helfrich. Um, Helfrich has a, uh, a calculation or an argument for the stiffness of a membrane. And the main point of that is that the, his prediction or his argument for the Gaussian curvature modulus involves the in-plane lateral stresses, does not involve the Young's modulus, which is what enters for the uh, Gaussian curvature modulus, the diff which is enter enters for the bending stiffness. And the reason why there's a difference is because it's a fluid membrane. It's not a solid membrane. So using his calculation, we and because the f you know it's such a difference because the membrane, the rods are squeezed together by the polymers in solution. And so the, Gaussi the um, Gaussian curvature modulus, uh, the intrinsic contribution from the membrane is going to be proportional to the pressure, the osmotic pressure. And then, you know, there's some geometrical factors. And this comes out to be about 100 kBT. That's the estimate that we would get from Helfrich. There's another, and it's negative, right, because it's a compressive uh, force from the polymers. There's another contribution, which is simply from the entropy of the polymers. We have to look at the volume that the polymers are able to explore. And that volume depends on the shape of the membrane. If the membrane has a positive Gaussian curvature, 
or if it's flat, then there's less room for the membrane for the polymers to move around in than if the membrane has a negative Gaussian curvature. So this again comes from the same uh, fact that if you take a, a, a membrane and, and you imagine the center as just a mathematical surface and you move out in the normal direction, the, uh, uh, the aerial strain will be proportional, it will involve the Gaussian curvature, Gaussian curvature to second order. So accounting for the uh, free energy of this effect leads to a positive contribution to the Gaussian curvature modulus. And we think that that contribution is big enough that it will overcome the negative contribution. So our overall estimate for the Gaussian curvature modulus is around 200 kVT, much, much smaller than this bending stiffness, which means that that's actually going to simplify a lot of the analysis. We're mostly going to consider that these surfaces are minimal surfaces because it's very hard to depart from zero mean curvature. So I said that uh, these rods are often Typic they are typically chiral, so we need some way of putting the chirality into the theory. Everything I've talked about so far, you know, it's made out of scalars. And the, because this chirality is coming from the twist of the rods, the hint is that that has to be something that has to do with the edge in our effective theory. So maybe a natural thing to think about is the torsion of the edge, as, you know, that's the rate at which the normal to the edge, thought of as a curve, that's the rate that that normal twists around the tangent, but that's not a good quantity to put into an energy because if, if the rod is, or the edge is straight, then we don't know what direction the normal points in. But there is a natural, uh, there is another natural vector that we can look at. We can look at the normal to the surface and we can ask, you know, how fast does that twist around the edge as we move along the edge? That's the geodesic torsion. So we can write down another edge energy, which is basically, uh, preference for having some specific spontaneous torsion, tau g star. We don't know what these quantities are. We're going to have to estimate them. There's a stiffness b, which or b prime, which we think is, we're going to just take it to be the same stiffness of bending the edge. And there's a cross term, which I'll call c star. This will be our, our chiral term. And um, we don't have a, a, a geometric or a physical argument for what the, these quantities should be, um, but we simply write it down because it's allowed by the uh, symmetries of the problem. And, and of course, there's precedent for having the chirality of the constituents leading to chirality of the shape. So um, here is our fluctuating membrane. So we can look at the simplest case of, uh, oh, that's supposed to be just a movie. That's the fluctuations. So these are out of plane fluctuations. So the question is, here you can see that it's sort of rotating there. So we just want to look at the initial state where we, we just ask, when is this straight edge unstable to forming a helical ripple? Question. Certainly that chiral term should be proportional to that. The idea is, is just that the twist penetration depth is, is short, right? So that's why we're treating it like an edge term. So it, it's going to be, you know, presumably this, this will be proportional to the twist penetration depth. Uh, let me come to that. Let me first, first I'm starting to just talk about the instability. So I'll come back to that in a minute. So I think that's something different. So we just, I'm just looking for now, I'm just looking at the fluctuation of the edge. And I'm looking at the just linear stability analysis of the straight edge. And um, that is, you know, I'm, I'm treating it as if the twist penetration depth is very short. So I'm going to use this effective theory. There's a penalty for making the edge longer, right? The line tension, there's a penalty for bending it or giving it some geodesic torsion. But the Gaussian curvature modulus, which is negative, would like to have this shape and also the, the twisting. So I think that's what's driving it. The, the wavelength that first goes unstable is actually uh, the line tension, the square root of the line tension divided by the bending stiffness, not the, the twist penetration depth is not in this picture, right? So that's what sets the, um, the instability, and um, you know, you can see that as you increase the line tension gamma, you're going to make it harder. This is like a phase diagram. You're going to make it harder and harder to um, make the system go unstable, either by increasing C star, the chirality, or by increasing the Gaussian curvature modulus. So we can look at the fluctuations of the edge. Now, here's a kind of experimental subtlety. 
this, um, this, is, the, this is a different, the, the ones that form the ribbons are not, it's a different strain than the strain of viruses for which I showed the, the first power spectrum, where we didn't see a peak. The ones that form ribbons show a peak in the power spectrum, and the peak is right around that square root of gamma over B, which is about one micron, um, or one inverse micron uh, for Q. So we think this peak is the, you know, it's the incipient instability of the formation of the ribbons. And what you see here as, is as you increase the chirality, decreasing the temperature, that's when the peak forms. So as you get closer to this instability, you start to see this peak. We can fit this with our, um, with our model, we don't we the, we fit we just take the Gaussian curvature model just to be 50 kBT. We don't do any fooling around. That's a little lower than our uh, estimate, but that's what gave these reasonable fits. We thought, and then we fit the line tension and this chiral coupling, and you know it, we get reasonable behavior. We can fit the curves pretty well. It uh, explains why we have this peak. There's um, also we're looking at the in-plane fluctuations. We think they're going to be out-of-plane fluctuations because of the chirality. There's a coupling between the out-of-plane fluctuations and the in-plane fluctuations anytime you have a helical fluctuation of the edge. And of course, once you have out-of-plane fluctuations, there'll be some Gaussian curvature, though these things depend on the Gaussian curvature modulus. That's why this, this power spectrum depends on the Gaussian curvature modulus. Okay, so now I will turn to the second problem, which is the formation of these ribbons by pulling on them. And now here, this is really where we, um, we are pushing, admittedly pushing this model beyond where it should be valid. Um, so I'm going to take this model and just see what it predicts for taking a membrane which is stable. It doesn't want to form ribbons. And we're going to pull on it. And uh, it does get thin with a radius which is comparable to the, uh, there we go, comparable to the twist penetration depth. But we're just going to see what this theory says. Sorry. I had a little trouble with the cursor. OK. So it's already being pulled before it's reoriented. They're, they're pulling it and reorienting it. And it's actually already twisted a little bit here. It's very hard to see that it's twisted. So on the left, you see force versus extension. What we can, these experiments are not easy to do. There's a lot of variability in the experiments when they look at Different membranes of the same size in the sample, they can get differences in the force extension of up to 20%. So nevertheless, what we can say is that for low extensions, there's a linear, um, you know, linear force versus extension relationship. And then they seem to plateau. These, these smaller membranes um, are stiffer. And I'm not really sure what's going on here. Um, they, those seem to be harder to, to study. So can we, you know, let's first just understand the basics of the uh, force versus extension. So it doesn't twist very much, we saw, when you first start extending it. So we could first just make the simplest model. Let's just see what, you know, what would it do if we just have the line tension. We've already seen this today and in other talks, we, you know, by the Young-Laplace law. This is an incompressible membrane, right? So by the Young-Laplace law, the pressure inside that you have because of the area constraint is going to balance against the uh, line tension times the curvature. And if you just have line tension, you would just have these arcs. So it's very easy to calculate what the spring constant should be. It should be given by the line tension divided by the uh, uh, radius of the membrane. And it should go to some plateau, right? So when you pull it out, again, ignoring the twist for the moment, just in this two-dimensional case, when you pull it out, once, once the curvature is very gentle, there'll be very little pressure inside the membrane, and the force will just be twice the line tension, and you would expect a, a plateau. The membranes do have some bending stiffness. The bending stiffness is actually quite small, but that will round off the, um, uh, the cusps at the edge. And um, in this case, the, the bending stiffness, or rather the line tension, is something like 1,000 kBT per micron. So this, this correction from the bending stiffness of the edge is small. And there's going to be a correction to the plateau. It's not, that, um, it's not that big. So again, we would expect to see a plateau. But of course, the membranes twist, so we have to put in the chirality. We have to allow the membranes to twist out of the plane. So we put in the uh, Gaussian curvature modulus. We still solve a two-dimensional problem, solve for the, the shape of the edge, because what we do is we say, since the bending stiffness we think is so large, we'll put this whole thing on a helicoid of unknown pitch. So in addition to solving for the shape, we'll also solve for the 
pitch of the helicoid. And um, this is what the shape looks like if you unwind the helicoid. So in the, as a function of the um, displacement, um, the, the twist increases. It increases continuously, but it's a, it's a rather small twist initially. So um, using all the parameters that we've either measured from the uh, fluctuation experiment or estimating without doing any fitting, we can more or less get the, you know, we can get the right size for the uh, spring constant of the membranes, and, um, and we do see that there's some sort of plateau. I should mention that when we, or when they uh, stretch further, they can stretch it long enough or far enough that they're actually changing the area of the membrane and, and seeing some overstretching where you get another uh, linearly increasing regime. All right, so I will uh, quickly talk about the last thing, which is really something very recent, um, these axisymmetric membranes. And there's just some inter there's an interesting uh, thing about how they form. So this is made from mixtures of long rods and short rods. Uh, what you're seeing here, I'll play this again. You're, seeing the, the, you're looking down the axis of one of these axisymmetric membranes, so it looks like a circle. But what you saw is uh, they form from two potato chips. These are potato chips that come together and um, wrap up and form this axisymmetric shape. So they have a phase diagram as a function of the, long the fraction of long rods and short rods. So there's a very small region where they have about 25% short rods where you get these axisymmetric shapes. And um, the interesting physics is that these short rods tend to segregate toward one face of the membrane. They can catch them in the act of hopping across the membrane, but they're always on one side or the other. So um, we don't understand this completely, but certainly that is to say, what we think is happening is that there's, the, there's some kind of separation where the short rods are all going to one side. We don't know why that happens. But what we do instead, it was we just say, well, we observe that we get these shapes. We know what the concentration of the short rods are. We know what their size is. And from that, we can say what the spontaneous curvature would have to be as a function of the concentration of short rods. So we can solve for the shape, and, and we find that we get these unguloids, again, using this effective theory. Um, we also do it with the full liquid crystal. Um, those are the two solid lines there. And the dots are the, um, uh, the, dots are the shapes that have been measured. And again, uh, I'm out of time, so you know, we can make a prediction for where you should see, uh, as a function of the concentration of the short rods or the long rods, where you should see a transition from the disks to unguloids. And again, we think it has to do with this Gaussian curvature modulus. So I will um, stop here. The summary is that we make this very simple effective geometric theory. It's, it's only strictly valid for membranes which are large compared to the uh, penetration depth, but we make all these predictions that we can test and compare with the experiments. And there's the estimates and several different experiments suggest that in these systems, the Gaussian curvature modulus is, is positive. So again, I've listed all the people that um, have been working on this, and I'll take more questions. <laughs>